So good morning, everybody. So I'm Jérôme Boulanger. I'm working at the Light Microscopy uh, Facility here at the LMB. I will talk today about image processing for light microscopy more specifically. Uh, most of what I will say is uh, general and would apply to other sort of microscopy or imaging in general, but I will focus on the problem which are associated to, to light microscopy. Um, so we start by why do we process images? Uh, we want to improve uh, the image quality. So for example, we want to uh, improve the signal to, to noise uh, ratio uh, by either reducing the amount of noise or increasing the signal by improving, for example, the sharpness of the image. We can also think about background correction to remove fluctuation in the image which are not related to what we want to measure. Um, we want also some time to stabilize the uh, image to a reference frame uh, or register the image um, between uh, channels or um, across different samples to be able to, for example, do some sort of averaging. We want to uh, recognize objects and features. So this was the first part where we improve our image. We want to um, so recognize object and feature. Um, we want to, for example, attribute a semantic class. For example, each pixel here will be uh, associated with a class which is color coded in blue, orange, and red. We want to identify instances of objects. Uh, for example, here we have Alice and Bob. So we basically identify a distinct object in, in, this, in, a, in the image by the most um, simplest way to do this is to find uh, um, connected components. Um, and finally, we would like to quantify biological processes, measure directly the fluorescence intensity, um, either a relative intensity or a recovery over time, such as in fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching experiments. We want to count to, ex to get a number, a number of cells, number of organelles, number of bacteria inside a cell, of foci. We want to extract information about shapes, such as area, perimeter, volumes, um, for example, roughness. Uh, etc. We can also measure information on motion, such as velocity or amount of deformation. We would eventually uh, get back to some information about the stress or the constraint, the force in, in the sample. Um, at the end of the day, we want to characterize a phenotype. Um, we would, in a very stereotypical uh, kind of uh, workflow, have one of uh, two or more conditions. For each condition, we will acquire several images corresponding to the same sample or um, different samples. We, from these images, we will. Um, Process, or process, extract some information uh, following the, the workflow I just described to end up with uh, some measurement for each cell, for example, like in this case, and end up with a statistical analysis, which will um, confirm or infer the, uh, the hypothesis we had at the beginning. So what uh, makes a good analysis workflow? Uh, we want it to be objective, to not depend on the person who does analysis. We want it to be quantitative, so to provide a measurement which is related to, to the phenotype we are trying to characterize. We want it to be reproducible. So we want that we can, to be able to repeat the same analysis, the same experiment, uh, again and again and lead to the same conclusion. And we want it to be scalable. So ideally, scalable. so we want to, to be able to, 
to repeat the same task, the same analysis, each step for each images uh, many times. So this uh, kind of plead for uh, some sort of automation where there is a minimum input from, uh, from the user. So this can be achieved uh, via scripting or visual programming. There are different ways of doing this. Uh, but this is the idea that you want to automate uh, what, what you can. But before automating and processing lots of images, we want to have a look first. We want, as they are not just pretty picture, and, but still, uh, you want to have a look at them. We, the idea is to try to build an overview of the project and estimate the viability and understand whether or not what uh, the hypothesis you, you have in mind might be able to uh, be uh, tested using the data you have. You want to discount some outlier, such as overexposed sample, dead cell, etc. And you don't want to blindly basically batch process thousands of images without looking at them. This is, uh, in many cases, uh, wrong. Or you could do it if you already did some, some sort of preliminary analysis where you're confident that you're just repeating the same thing again. Um, so this would work. Um, and ultimately, you, you would go and check the, the statistic at the end of the statistic analysis if you see any outliers. Uh, it's a good idea to go back and to try to explain uh, why this point is different. So it could be um, an error in the analysis, an error in the acquisition, or true outlier of biological, biologically uh, relevant outlier. Um, so how, there is a step where um, you could also think uh, when you're taking your picture, how you, you will make it easier from the beginning. So the success of the analysis will depend on how you plan a bit ahead when you prepare your sample and, and went on the microscope. So for example, a good idea is to add uh, housekeeping labels, such as uh, nuclei staining, cell membrane staining, uh, if you want to have statistics for each cells, you want uh, also to control the cell confluence level. So you don't want to have too crowded space, but you still want to compromise with a, uh, a good N number. Uh, you want to choose the right microscopy approach. It's not useful to have uh, very detailed images if the phenotype is, is um, already uh, visible at a lower resolution, you will just uh, have to handle a massive amount of data for no reason, no good reason. So choose, it's very similar to the right acquisition parameter, optimize the acquisition parameter for the kind of information you want to extract, um, such as objective magnification, or, exposure time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, and when you take the picture, thing, it helps to think on what step you will do to analyze the image. Um, sometime it might, you take a, a few images uh, with um, the first experiment and then you, you think that if you would have had these levels or image a bit differently, then it will help the analysis and at the end help uh, validating your hypothesis. Finally, there is another thing is sometime a, a very automated pipeline is difficult to build and a few uh, input from the user might uh, at the end uh, save a lot of time because you will spend less time developing the analysis are uh, sorting the outliers just because you, you gave a bit of, of input for the tricky step in the analysis. So let's start now about what is an image, more uh, detail about 
the, the, the methods itself. So an image is a measurement on a regularly sample grid. The grid can be two dimensional, three dimensional, four dimensional if you have time, or five dimension if you have also a set of channels. So you have um, some of sometimes some very large or uh, high dimensional data, uh, which can also be very large uh, just because many movies, 3D movies, are just take a lot of space. So these pixels, so these images, so this measurement can be represented as an array of pixels. It's how they are mostly collected on the microscope. Um, it can be seen as, as well as a sample version of a continuous function. So this can help you to develop an analysis or a method to process the image. It can be seen also as a Fourier transform. So you project your data on a different basis, which is the Fourier, uh, sorry, Fourier coefficient, so waves. It can be seen as a random field where it, um, the image is actually a graph where if there is, there are, you would model interaction between neighboring pixels. Uh, you could represent your image as a wavelet coefficient. So here we have a different sort of uh, basis, such as very similar to the Fourier transform. It could be also a dictionary of features which are redundant, so which are at the end do not compress your image, but uh, spread the information on more features. So this, for example, can be useful for learning uh, uh, where you want to classify a uh, pixel based on some feature you have measured in the image. So the simplest thing you can do, uh, one of the simplest thing you can do to your image is to uh, do some image filtering. So we can distinguish two kinds of filters, the linear filters which are also called convolutions. They combine uh, neighboring pixels with a predefined, predefined weight, which doesn't depend on the location in the image. So here we see this orange rectangle, which would be, for example, averaging all the value, uh, which are in, within this rectangle and replace the center value by this average. So this is, would be a mean filter if you would have some weights on each, depending on the location inside the orange rectangle. So within the filter, then you would have, for example, if they, this uh, weight follow a Gaussian function would be a Gaussian filter, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a linear filter such as the one I, such as averaging filter or a Gaussian filter, are equivalent as a multiplication in a Fourier space. So in the space of fre frequency. So it will be multiplication of the Fourier transform of the filter by the Fourier transform of the image. This will give you the Fourier transform of the filtered image. There are also nonlinear filters, which are nonlinear combination of this uh, nearby pixel in this orange neighborhood. You could compute the median of um, the pixel inside the orange rectangle and replace the center value by this median value. Or you could compute the minimum or the maximum filter and so on and so forth. So we have here the yeah, analogy is a brush for the linear filter, which is um, drawing your image with, uh, for example, a thicker line if, uh, in the case of, of a uh, median filter, for example, you replace with a thicker line uh, each pixel. So now we can um, think of our image as uh, measurements and each uh, pixel would have uh, a distribution associated to, to this measurement. So the error which of, of measurement will help us uh, define uh, 
a likelihood, uh, so which tells us how likely is uh, the observed data given uh, a model. And we can add to this uh, measurement an idea, and an a priori a smoothness on based on some feature of the image. So we can um, add some information that would be missing otherwise and not um, help us so to, to solve the problem the, we want to, to, to solve. Then once we have these two components, we can def, um, associate um, a cost function, which will make a compromise between the likelihood and the a priori information we have on the, on the image or on the thing we want to estimate and um, perform a gradient descent, which will give us um, our estimate. Uh, so many filters can be reinterpreted in this context and the typical task we, you know, we are using for in this uh, context are denoising, deconvolution, segmentation, and motion estimation, I would say. We can also uh, consider learning-based approach where we would train uh, a model uh, to make the link between uh, some input and some output. For this, we will collect some example of input and output, some X and some Y that are known. So this is often the painful part where you have to um, input and define this uh, uh, X and Y. We will define a model as well. So this can be in just as choosing um, a machine learning algorithm or a, an architecture uh, for a, a deep learning uh, model where you would have to define what can, how um, uh, parts of the data relate to the other part of the data, for example, with convolution or et cetera, et cetera. So once we have the model and the training data, X and Y, we can define a cost function to compare the predicted output on the known output. And then similarly to the variational approaches, we will optimize the cost function. Here, the nice thing is that we don't have to derive manually um, the equation of the um, gradient descent, for example. In, for deep learning method, for example, we have um, a different um, method to differentiate and estimate the gradient uh, automatically from, from the model. So now from given an unseen input X, we can predict the, the corresponding Y. And here the task will be basically often segmentation on detection of objects. Let's start with a first task where we have um, uh, basically when we are imaging in microscopy, we have uh, a limited number of photons. Um, they are a function of the um, exposure time on the illumination and the photons interact with the sample. They produce free radicals and we have also the effect of photo bleaching of the fluorophore, which at the end leads to a limited number of photons, which can be used to image our sample. So in, on the sensor, the fact that we have a limited number of events we are trying to count, the photon uh, changes the sensor, leads to an intrinsic Poisson distribution of the number of detected events. The amplitude of uh, the Poisson noise, uh, is equal to the expected number of photons. So the, st uh, the standard deviation is equal to the, uh, the variance is actually equal to the mean of the, the photon counting process. Um, 
We have also some other source of noise, such as a dark current, which is often neglected in, in uh, nowadays uh, sensors, and a readout noise, which is a thermal fluctuation in, in the electronic circuitry, and which can be uh, measured in, in electron uh, and photoelectron. So when you, you use a camera, you can uh, characterize the sensor using the data sheet or measuring the property of the camera using uh, a test sample. Uh, this will allow you to link the gray value and the number of photon electron and also get a characterization of the noise distribution. So eventually to, to choose your sensor based on what you, you would like to, to do. Now, but once you know that you have a noisy image, you may want to simply denoise it. This is a, a thing you, you will always in some way do using a simple filter or such as a median filter or a Gaussian filter or using a more uh, advanced approach. Um, so the idea of denoising is to estimate an image which could have been, uh, which could be the average of many images taken of the same thing. So what we, you want really to remove is some stochastic noise. It's not some sort of background. It's not some sort of blur. It's really the uh, stochastic and random uh, effect we have due to photo counting and the readout noise uh, mainly. So in the past, we have proposed this, this technique, which is um, a non-local patch-based approach where the correlation between image blocks are used to, um, to estimate the intensity of the image. We use this uh, correlation in 3D and in time, and we take into account the Poisson and Gaussian noise using a variance stabilization approach. So we see um, uh, here the middle graph that without denoising, we would have uh, an in, um, improvement of the signal to noise ratio when the exposure time goes up and or conversely, a degradation of this uh, signal to noise ratio when the exposure goes, goes down. And then we can risk, risk, uh, rescue this uh, signal to noise ratio using a denoising and get a sort of equivalent uh, exposure time uh, using this equivalent graph, which is sample specific anyway. Um, you can also use uh, some deep learning methods where you would collect, for example, pair of noisy and noise free image and train a unit uh, model to map the noisy to the clean image. Uh, this, um, there are pre trained models accessible in Fiji. Um, there are also uh, deep learning methods which are uh, unsupervised, so will not use a um, pair of noisy and noise free image. Second thing, second effect we have on our image uh, after the noise is the signal is band limited. Um, so the um, so if we can approximate the image formation, the image we have as um, an image which is uh, filtered by a linear filter in 3D, and this filter is called the point spot function. Again, it corresponds to a, a multiplication in Fourier space by the what we call the optic, optical transfer function. The optical transfer function is uh, the Fourier transfer of the point spike function. And the one main property of this point spike function is that they vanish, of oh, this optical transfer function is that they vanish um, beyond the resolution limit, which is given by the wavelengths over twice the numerical aperture. This is AB uh, formula. So here we see our cat in, uh, representing the image space. Um, and uh, we see uh, in the Fourier space, the information is limited uh, 
to uh, the inside of the disk, which is uh, defined by lambda over 2NA or the inverse of it in, um, in a Fourier space. Uh, and then this gives us, um, so this is a drawback, but also we can use it as a fact we can uh, to sample our image uh, because uh, the Nyquist Shannon theorem tells us that if we have a sample which is regularly uh, sampled with um, some which, um, a band limited signal, uh, so, so we can reconstruct it with no loss if the, the, the pitch of the sampling is uh, half the resolution limit. So here, the ideal sampling in X and Y would be the wavelength divided by four times the numerical aperture. Um, yes, so here we can see how this, so in, Interesting thing that details. So the sample here, we have two samples with um, little waves inside this uh, darker, uh, brighter and thicker uh, lines, in which goes in two directions. So we can take the Fourier transform. We see um, some information a bit everywhere. Apply the low pass filtering, which correspond to observing this sample using a microscope. And at the end, of, in the microscope, these two samples will look identical. So we have no way to know what, what is uh, beyond uh, this, um, this resolution limit. So we don't know what is the structure of the object. Another way to see this, for example, this acting ring circling the axon image in stone, you will see the the talk from John on, on superresolution methods. If we apply the same operation where we take a Fourier transform, we see the lines far away from the center of the image, which is at zero frequency, uh, are representing, are associated to the energy of the stripes, the, the acting rings. Our white field microscope, for example, will not uh, image those uh, until these lines, which are I think 290 uh, nanometer apart. And in the best case, the image would have looked like this on the standard microscope. We would have no way to know that there were acting rings uh, on these axons. Um, so the point spot function is, uh, is a model of our microscope. It assumes a linear response and uh, which is identical in each point of the image, which is an oversimplification, of course. Um, it represents the image of each point in, uh, as viewed by the microscope. So, uh, and is a, it is a function of the numerical aperture, the wavelengths, and the aberration. Um, it will depend also on the type of microscopy here, for example, we have a variation of the size of the confocal pinhole at one area unit and, and five uh, area units. We can see that the size of the paintbrush is basically uh, varying a lot depending on the size of the pinhole. Um, so now we, we would like to um, correct for this big thick brush that the microscope is using to paint our sample. So what, we, uh, what is this called is called deconvolution because we, our image is, the recorded image is convolved, is a sample convolved by the point spread function. So what we want to do is inverse this convolution um, effect. Um, so we saw that um, the convolution is actually a multiplication in Fourier space of the Fourier transform of the sample by the Fourier transform of the point spread function. Unfortunately, the Fourier transform of the point spread function called the OTF goes to zero. So 
we will end up dividing by zero. And before actually dividing by zero, we will start amplifying the noise when the uh, point spread function uh, amplitude is uh, starting to be below the noise level. So, so we, we can't simply uh, apply what would be called an inverse uh, filter. So we can use here Bayesian approach or um, some other a priori to prevent the noise amplification. So here we, we have to say something about our image. We can't just use the data, otherwise we can't restore the, um, the image at all. So the common algorithms are uh, a Wiener filter, which is a um, regularized uh, inverse filter in the simplest way. Uh, we have uh, Richard, Richardson Lucy uh, algorithm, which is very common in microscopy. It takes into account the, uh, the positivity of the data and the uh, fact that the main contribution of the noise is a uh, photon limited imaging, so the Poisson noise. We can also formulate all these constraints and use, for example, a conjugate gradient algorithm to minimize our cost function and estimate our image. Um, there are many uh, algorithms for, for, for deconvolution. So, but the, the one you will often see would be the Richardson Lucy algorithm for in microscopy. So, here is an effect of, of the deconvolution on this image. Um, so, yeah, so the, where do you find um, a deconvolution? It would be um, using Arrogance. Is a, is a, most uh, well-known deconvolution software. It has a um, sort of wizard to help you through the steps to uh, estimate the PSF. Uh, it has two main algorithm and it's also running on the GPU, so it makes it faster. You can also access to deconvolution modules directly uh, when you're doing the acquisition in uh, in Nikon uh, systems, and then when you use an air scan, there is already a Wiener filter, which is performing the deconvolution. Um, you can use also deconvolution lab in Fiji. In MATLAB, you will have access to deconv Lucy for Richardson Lucy and deconv Wiener for, for the Wiener filter. You have also access to deconvolution in, in scikit image in, in Python. Um, so this deconvolution is mostly used in uh, wide field imaging and light sheet microscopy. It could still be used and useful in other kind of more confocal uh, microscopes um, and um, instead, for example, in the air scan by default is, is using a, a deconvolution to extract the most of the image from the uh, 32 uh, images which have been acquired. Another common problem or is the image registration. So we can estimate motion between channels, so such as decrease shift time. Uh, maybe there is some drift of uh, the slide in or, or, or the stage, kind of a sample deformation, can estimate force or tracks um, particles. We can, um, when we do tiling, the tiles might be a little bit shifted between uh, each time the, the microscope goes back to the same position. So we need some uh, registration to perform this, the stitching. We can also uh, estimate the motion between samples to build, for example, an atlas. Um, so the sort of data which is used in registration can be some landmarks, so based on control points, such as, for example, you could have bits, you could have um, some features in the image which are used for registering the, um, the pair of image, or you could also extract automatically those uh, control points. Uh, they can, it can be also intensity-based, um, where you use directly the intensity to register the image. Um, 
So you could have a mix of the two. You could have also different kind of models. You can have a para parametric model, such as translation, rotation, rigid body, fine. And that's all in general in, um, in microscopy. You could have also a non-parametric uh, dense deformation field where um, you could have deep vari uh, different amount of smoothness between uh, the pixel or the, the, the vectors uh, at different pixels. So you have correlation to solve these registration problems. You can have correlation-based approach, which are the simplest one. They will allow you to easily uh, correct drift or align channels uh, based on um, for example, uh, cross correlation in a, in a Fourier space or phase correlation. You could uh, use um, Fourier Mellon transform for um, uh, correcting or estimating rotations. You can also have um, a dense uh, correlation based approach, which is also called um, uh, particle image velocimetry. It uses normalized uh, cross correlation. And but it's usually very uh, noisy to estimate a uh, displacement field. Landmark registration. Uh, so as I say, estimate the deformation using control point. We can so we we need to find the corresponding point. So you can use a ransack, which is uh, randomly uh, uh, generating some subset of the points to try to find the main. Uh, uh, the transformation, which is the most uh, common, or you can use uh, what is called a coherent point drift uh, algorithm, which is um, an iterative uh, and with a sort of Bayesian uh, formulation of the uh, iterative um, uh, point match pair uh, assignment. Um, and so we can uh, estimate the parameter of the model using a least square once you have the pair. And uh, you could use also using uh, this point, uh, what is called a thin plate spline to have a continuous deformation model using just these uh, control points. So for example, you can find this a method in a big warp in, in a, uh, Fiji, which is used a thin plate spline. Um, you could have um, access to the uh, coherent point drift algorithm in Python. Our ITK is also very, uh, which is accessible in Python or C++, offer lots of uh, method for uh, registration of, of points. Um, so another approach is um, to estimate deformation is to use more intensity-based uh, approaches, which is uh, assuming uh, preservation of the intensity over time. So it's similar to particle image value symmetry. Added pixel will have displacement. Uh, there is an ambiguity along contour, so we need uh, some smoothness to get a unique solution. And we use also a multi-scale approach for being able to estimate large displacement because this method in general see uh, at most one pixel away. So they estimate a very small displacement. So using a multi-scale approach, we can uh, enable them to, to see a larger displacement um, but still with a sub-pixel uh, precision. Um, another problem which is um, happening or appearing often is you want to detect some spots or some blob, which are anything which is not very resolved or not very, uh, which not a specifically very well-defined contour. It can be as big as a nuclei, for example, or as small as a vesicle or a single molecule. So there are various blob detectors, such as local max. You could use a simple local maxima, so where brightest uh, as a sort of dome in the, in the intensity, 
You can use some filtering, such as uh, difference of Gaussian, Laplacian of Gaussian. This will extract blobs at a specific scale, so you can specify, give your uh, input on, on the scale of the object you want to, um, to extract and to detect. Um, it can be combined with some um, model fitting, like 2D or 3D Gaussian fitting, such as single, in single molecule localization microscopy. And it's relatively easy to script from scratch in Fiji and Imagine or MATLAB and Python. Um, you can use uh, TrackMate or Thunderstorm to, to detect blobs or spots. I see as a wavelet spot detector, so you can use wavelet as well as a, a specific kind of wavelet, which is uh, well suited for uh, blob detection. There is also um, a spot detection module in, in Imaris, which can be uh, useful. Um, just a side note, so these simple techniques are very useful when there are not many other structure in the image, um, or they are at very different scale. If they are, for example, lines and spots at the same kind of uh, scale, then you might want to resort to some sort of learning method to uh, distinguish between, as a, more precisely between the, the spots or the, the very spherical kind of um, feature in the image from like more lines, which will often also respond to, um, to the filters, the, spot det the blob detector filters. So it can be, a, might have to, to dig a bit more sometimes. Finally, we, we can talk about image uh, segmentation when you want to assign a uh, a label to each pixel. So there are two types of segmentation. Uh, there is a semantic segmentation where each pixel will belong to, to a class to an instance segmentation where after doing this layoff of assigning uh, each pixel to a class, you want to identify different objects in the scene, such as different nuclei, different cells, etc. Et um, you can uh, use um, sim very simple approaches, uh, such as thresholding uh, um, watershed. So these are um, the go-to method when things are easy. Uh, you can use active contour when you have a well-defined object far away from, from the others to have a, maybe a better and a smooth uh, representation of, of your object. Um, you can use um, uh, so Markov random field and graph cut to um, improve the smoothness also of your segmentation. So, so this, uh, for example, you can use R on the probability kind of field to uh, assign uh, uh, a, a better or a smoother uh, contour to, to your objects. So this is done often after uh, a machine learning kind of classification using a graph, graph cut approach. Uh, you can use um, some pixel classification, uh, some deep learning such as UNET, uh, some uh, or mask or CNN. Um, we have now studies for nuclear, which are more specific to um, to specific uh, sort of object and. And also, we'll see uh, in a minute cell pose, uh, which are uh, start to be very interesting as uh, being already pre trained. Um, so, the basic method are you can find them anywhere. Um, you have, uh, you can use for pixel classification, um, Waker, trainable Waker segmentation in Fiji. Elastic, which is a standalone program, and LabKit, which is a plugin in Fiji, which, are, um, which start to be uh, um, very interesting for, um, for pixel classification. Um, you can also use a deep learning method, as I say. So UNET is a bit, was a bit convoluted to use in Fiji, but um, 
Uh, Stardis is, in, is accessible in, in, in Fuji. Cellpose um, is very effective in, in Python. Um, so here, uh, I can, an example, Stardis for, for uh, nuclei segmentation. So we represent each um, region of interest by star convex polygon. We learn for each pixel the method. We learn for you for each pixel the distance r to the boundary in in a set of k directions, which are rays, um, and then the Euclidean distance d to the boundary of the object as a probability of, of having an object, of being inside an object. And it uses UNET to, um, uh, so you, to um, learn uh, the model, which will associate the image, so the input, um, the image X to a set of um, R and D, and then there will be a step on non-maximum non -maximum, uh, suppression, NMS, to find the, the final object. So this has been uh, the, the weight, the parameter of this model have been pre-trained on various data, data sets in 2D and in 3D, so you can often just use them uh, without retraining. And it's actually accessible in, in Fuji, so it's really um, practical to use. And it also gives you a smooth uh, a boundary of, of the object. Another approach is, which I found uh, interesting is cell pose, which also have been pre-trained. Uh, here, instead of um, using a star convex polygon, um, in, it will try to uh, predict uh, the spatial gradient of a simulated uh, diffusion and so which we see on the top and use the spatial gradient once to um, to find the center and assign for each pixel in the image the uh, the center of the cell so by uh, backtracking the gradient and, and this will help define some, some mask. So here we have, again, a unit text inside as an input the image as an output, the, the spatial gradient. And, and then the algorithm will, will find uh, later on the, uh, the, the center of the cell to, to identify individual cells. The interesting thing is that the, um, the model has been trained with a, on a variety of images. And we can see here that each um, image, which class of image, uh, like fluorescence or uh, some um, DIC or some other uh, sort of imaging modality will correspond to a different cluster in some uh, weight, uh, which are representing this style of the image, which is appearing in the, uh, in the middle layers here of, of the unit. So the, after the uh, first um, uh, down sampling path. Um, so this will, this is very interesting that they allow, they, they, they kind of encode directly different sort of of images and basically will recognize the kind of image and use uh, the appropriate uh, uh, weighting when doing the um, upscaling pass in of the unit. Um, we can also uh, consider like once we have object, we can track them over time. Um, the difficulty of the tracking will be uh, measured as a density in a feature space. So how far away our different are the object on their apparent uh, velocity in, in this space. Um, so we have various algorithms. We can use a simple nearest neighbor if there is, is in the simplest case, or we can use uh, a minimize uh, the cost association. So it's, um, linear assignment problem that so we have distance matrix and we want to find a minimum association between the two. Um, 
the two frame. And so this is done frame by frame. Um, we can also use a motion model to predict the next position. So we use a sort of temporal filtering uh, to predict a uh, given one time point where it should be at the next time point and make the difference. So the cost matrix between these two, uh, the prediction on the observation. There yeah, are um, some challenges uh, with some which have been organized to test this algorithm. So you have cell tracking challenge and a particle tracking challenge where various methods have been tested. And we find this method in various software. So you have TrackMate in Fiji, so it's the most accessible one. In IC, we will have um, MH, MHT algorithm, which is uh, a bit more uh, complicated in terms of ocean model. And you have also tracking in uh, Imaris, tracking also in Nikon elements. So you have a lot of options when you want to do uh, object tracking. Um, finally, once you have your tracks, you might be interested in uh, analyzing the output of those tracks. You can uh, go back to instant velocities. Uh, you can measure variation of some features such as intensity over time of the object and you can extract also some mean square displacement msd to uh, get back to some measurements of diffusion sub diffusion or some um, uh, drift parameter and we can also estimate um, multi-state model for the motion so for example a single particle would go from a diff a diffusion only model, a drift plus diffusion when it goes on a microtubule and there is an active uh, motion um, motor, um, and then there will be a probability of uh, cycling across those different um, type of motions. Um, once you have a segmented object or, or not segmented them, you can also um, perform some sort of co localization. So, based on intensity, you're using a Spearman or Pearson correlation coefficient. You can use, uh, once you have regions, you can also compute overlap coefficient which are related to the Mandos coefficient. And then um, if you have a sub uh, diffractive object, you can measure um, pair correlation and K function between the distances between the, um, the objects. Um, and then one question is how much the colorization you measure is due to randomness and misalignment or, or blur. So you can uh, have various uh, approaches for testing uh, like randomness hypothesis, such as a cost uh, randomization test, or uh, there's some other more recent approaches where uh, which doesn't uh, rely on simulation. Um, and finally, once you have all this, you may want to uh, perform some sort of hierarchical analysis where for each image, uh, you would have various cells and you want for each cell to have a sort of uh, statistical summary. Uh, so you will need to build up uh, some sort of relationship between objects, such as proximity or inclusion. You would have to um, define some uh, semantic level image, part of an organ, a cell, an organ else. And how you do this is simply using some mask and some logical tests on the mask. Um, or you can also use a distance transform to find out uh, the distance between various regions. In practice, uh, so one um, power powerful kind of integrated approach we have here is a uh, Nikon uh, element. Makes it very easy to have this sort of hierarchical structure. Uh, you can also manipulate ROI in Fiji to um, test if some ROI belongs to another one or entirely or partly. You can also compute distance transform in Fiji. So this is also possible, which is useful for assigning uh, or also studying the distribution of the object in, inside the cell, for example. 
Um, and there is a cell biology module we have in, in Imaris, which is also able to establish this, this sort of uh, relationship. And so to summarize, there is a lot of software and tools to address the, the problems uh, that I, I went through. There are also some other problems you might, or steps in the analysis you may need to, to solve. Um, so basically, Fiji and Image is a general tool to go to uh, Imaris. Is, we have access here to, to Imaris. Uh, so it's good for visualization, spot detection, it's for everything in 3D. Imaris uh, was uh, and still is, I think, uh, a good software. And some, it was, at some point, a unique way to, to do it. Uh, we have also. Nikon Element generalizes three, which allows to define workflow. The new version of generalizes allows to go from the images to really the table you want to, uh, to output. So it's, it's pretty good for this. We have also new commerce such as Napari, which helps you to do visualization in Python, which is um, uh, useful if you create a pipeline, for example, using Python, using Scikit-Image, for example. Um, a new tool called Appear from Zeiss allows to define online workflows, uh, particularly geared toward machine learning and training for pixel uh, classifier. We have a cell profiler for more screening workflows. I see as also a lot of plugins and general tools for tracking spot detection, colorization, and even deconvolution. Um, you can also resort to uh, so Python uh, and scikit-image, NumPy, Matplotlib, Pandas for putting a, a pipeline together and combining with, for example, cell pose or deep learning approaches is particularly uh, easier in, in Python. Or you could use also MATLAB, which has uh, an extensive uh, image processing toolbox. So here is the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you for your attention. And um, if you have any question. So the question is, could you elaborate or comment on the possibility of using image calculations such as using n function between two channels to understand co-localization, would it be comparable to using Monders or Pearson coefficient? So, um, so will not be. Uh, so the Pearson coefficient is directly based on intensity. So there is no um, no need to define a mask on on some n function between channels. So unless you see the product of two images as an n function, which is possible, I mean, it's a bit of, uh, of a stretch. Uh, for the co-localization using Monders coefficient, um, so the n function will be useful to measure, so you will have to measure uh, in the intersection of the mask and the n function. So the, um, will help you to, 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 to do that, yes. But uh, it will not be directly between channels, it will be between mask, and then you will have to measure, I think the, I don't, I don't have the formula in mind exactly of the Monders coefficient, um, but yeah. And then I have a question in the Q and A, um, would you still prefer scripting-based image analysis or more automated software like Imaris? Uh, so the thing is, uh, in most of cases, so what I'm doing is, in my uh, situation, is help people do things they cannot do themselves. And in this, so for myself, I will have to, to use scripting-based image analysis more than Imaris, because Imaris in many cases is, is um, well documented enough to be used without my, my help. So, so myself, I, I, 
fortunately, I, I, I would love to be only doing Maris probably. <laughs> But the, the fact is, my, I'm, I'm useful in, in, in doing scripting based image analysis. Thank, thank you for coming to the, to the talk anyway.